the 1970s. A decade full of new inventions, great movies, fantastic television shows, further exploration of space, the list continues. It was a very busy decade. The television industry changed entirely with the introduction of Betamax and VHS in 1975 and 1976 respectively, but there was another home video format, a certain disc that was just there, silently moving around in the background. It launched on December the 11th, 1978. I say silently, even though the disc was ridiculously huge, stretching to 12 inches. It was the first of its kind, but it was way too late, and yet way too ahead of its time. This disc, that never really served a proper purpose, was called the Laser Disc. The official origins of the Laserdisc system has been disputed over the years, but most people say it began back in 1958, 20 years prior to its actual release. The technology that Laserdisc uses was invented by David Paul Gregg and James Russell in 1958 using a transparent disc. The name of the technology is known as Optical Video Recording Technology. It was also later used in the widely successful compact disc or CD in 1980. During this time, Greg was also working on something called an electron beam recording and reproducing system. He would later pass away in November of 2001 at the age of 78. James would later work on the CD and as far as I know, he's still alive at the age of 87 or 88. The patenting dates for the work of Greg and Russell on websites like Wikipedia have changed over the years and have been rather inconsistent. The dates mentioned are 1958, 1961, 1962, 1967, 1969, 1970, and 1990 for some reason. Regardless of when it was first patented, it's clearly obvious that the Laserdisc technology was stupidly way ahead of its time. Color TV was just becoming popular. Anyway, in 1968, the patents were bought by the Music Corporation of America, or MCA Inc. But this was still 10 years before the Laserdisc would go on sale. So what happened between 1968 and 1978? Well, a year later, in 1969, Philips created a video disc in reflective mode, which has more advantages than the original transparent version. Both Philips and MCA would then collaborate during the 1970s. They first publicly presented this video disc in 1972. Meanwhile, Sony and JVC would rise and begin working on their inventions, the U-Matic, the Betamax, and the VHS. The original patent didn't include any lasers whatsoever, mostly due to them being brand new and expensive to utilise. David Paul Gregg and James Russell's original idea would later include the use of lasers, since MCA and Philips had the money and technology to use these new lasers correctly once MCA bought the rights to their patents. If Gregg and or Russell were part of a company, or they have one, they would have possibly sold their creations differently to what came out in 1978. So the only reason why the Laserdisc became the Laserdisc is due to MCA buying the patents in 1968. Another major thing the two companies did was managing to operate the laser on both sides of the disc, multiplying the capacity by two. The original patent stated that using both sides would be possible, but some elements would have to be tweaked in order for that to work. One minor change that most people don't know is that they made the laser read the disc from the middle outwards towards the edge of the disc. Vinyl records, which were still popular in the 1970s, were always read from the outside in. During the 70s, MCA owned a large section of movies, so they saw the Laserdisc as a way of selling movies for home use in the same way Betamax and VHS do. It's interesting how MCA would enter the film industry with the creation of the Laserdisc when they originally began within the music business. And on December 11th, 1978, MCA and Philips would release their system as... DiscoVision! Yeah, I'll explain a bit. It became available first in Atlanta, Georgia, United States, and would slowly creep towards all four corners of the earth, but it immediately had issues. Again, I'll explain a bit. When Laserdisc was launched, the thing was known as MCA DiscoVision, or simply DiscoVision. While it's a clever name, it didn't last very long. This is where our third company joins, 
Pioneer, a Japanese multinational corporation, bought most of the rights to the format in 1980, and they marketed it as LaserVision, which was the format name, and LaserDisc, which was the brand name. That's right, Pioneer, which had nothing to do with the original product, bought the thing, and LaserDisc became a brand name of Pioneer. Think of it as a subsidiary. This is where this opening comes from. Both names were used, but LaserDisc became the standard universal name of the format eventually. What's on screen now is the normal LaserVision slash LaserDisc logo. You wouldn't see this logo on Pioneer Machines. You would instead see this. While LaserDiscs were still in development, there were some internal names for it. These include Optical Video Disc System, Reflective Optical Video Disc, Laser Optical Video Disc, and DiscoVision with a hyphen. The first movie to be released onto Laserdisc was Jaws from 1975, released on December 15, 1978, in a sleeve looking like this. The MCA DiscoVision logo looked like this. A lot of logo fans like this intro, although it's difficult to get in good quality nowadays due to the poor construction of these discs. More on that later. The disc contains pits looking similar to this, made out of simple binary of zeros and ones. When the disc is playing, a laser shines over these pits, reading both sound and visuals, which then plays back to your TV so you can see it and hear it. This is exactly the same with CDs, DVDs and Blu-rays. The only difference is the laser. In CDs, it's an infrared laser, on DVDs the laser is red, and on Blu-rays, it's, well, um, blue. The laser disc comes with its faults though, but what are these faults? Well... Before we go into why Laserdisc was doomed when it first launched, let's go through the pros of the format first. Arguably the most notable pro is the quality. The discs were capable of providing higher quality picture and sound than the Betamax and the VHS, despite the fact they were all analog. The Laserdisc also had chapter search and multiple audio tracks, allowing you to get to a certain scene without needing to rewind or fast forward. The DVD had these, but the Laserdisc came out almost 20 years before DVD. You could even jump to a specific frame by entering the frame number on the remote keypad, which was a feature most DVD players couldn't do. Another thing which I love is that it can skip over damaged spots on the disc pretty easily, whilst the DVD could often become unplayable past the damage, although this feature depends on the amount of damage. Another advantage, at least to some people, was the lack of any sort of anti-piracy technology. It was claimed that Macrovision's copyright guardian could not be applied to Laserdisc due to the format's design. All in all, this is a pretty good list of advantages. But now we get to the cons. The most obvious drawback was the disc's size. This picture shows different sizes of discs. The longest laser disc is 30 centimeters long, which is roughly 11.8 inches, slightly larger than a normal vinyl record. Here's a thing next to an average aluminum can, and here it is next to a DVD. They were huge discs. In order to hold it, you have to put two fingers in the hole of the center and place your thumb and the bottom of your hand on the side of the disc, like this. You could also use two hands by placing one on each side and then lifting it up. Not only were the discs large, they were also heavy. One disc weighs approximately 250 grams or over half a pound. To put that in perspective, one DVD or CD weighs an incredible 16 grams. You would need 15.625 DVDs or CDs to match the weight of one laser disc. That's crazy! When playing a laser disc in the player, the disc creates much more noise than a VHS, Betamax, or DVD because the discs were spinning unbelievably fast. Just listen to it. Another colossal drawback was the amount of time you could fit on one side of a disc. There were three types of discs. The main two are CAV and CLV. CAV stood for Constant Angular Velocity. Here's an example of a CAV laser disc. CLV stood for Constant Linear Velocity. 
For some reason, CLV releases didn't have the CLV name written anywhere on the front of the cases. The third one was called CAA. This stands for Constant Angular Acceleration. It's very similar to the CAV discs, but it was rarely ever used, so don't worry about it. On CLV discs, the maximum you could get on one side was 64 minutes, which was just a few more minutes than what the Betamax offered when they first launched. The minimum was an hour. On CAV discs, the most you could get on one side was 36 minutes. The least was 30. Let's say there's a movie that's exactly 2 hours or 120 minutes long and was only available in CAV form. This means for this movie you would need two discs with both sides being used, bringing the total to four sides. This was an undoubtedly huge inconvenience for Laserdisc owners as they would have to either flip the disc manually or change discs. Let's say the same two hour movie was released on VHS. You wouldn't need to change anything you can just pop it into your VCR and let it play. One thing you have to keep in mind though, is that the Laserdisc and the Betamax or VHS were never meant to do the same job. The whole original point of the Laserdisc was to watch new movies at home. Betamax and VHS were invented to record movies when not at home, so you can come home and watch what you missed on TV. This meant that the Laserdisc never really had a problem to solve, while this, the Betamax and VHS solved an issue. No one really minded going to the theater or cinema, depending on which country you're from, paying for a ticket and watching a movie. Watching movies were the exact same thing in the 70s and 80s as they were 50 years prior, and because people were so used to going to see a movie outside of their home, they didn't bother switching to Laserdisc, regardless of the price. Which then comes to the biggest con of the thing, it was too late. The format was being teased across the 60s and 70s, and when it finally came out, it didn't really do much due to how long people were waiting for it. By then, VHS and Betamax were dominating in sales, even though they weren't involved in the home video industry at this point. The prices of the Laserdisc machines were far cheaper than the VHS when they first launched, but again, people were so used to going outside to watch a movie at the theatre or cinema, they didn't bother turning to this new format. If it was released earlier, it would have had more success. Later, VHS and Betamax began to be used in the home video industry. They would later have all kinds of movies available to watch at home in a more convenient and comfortable way. They would later improve as their owners would bring in upgrades like Beta Hi-Fi and SVHS to improve both sound and picture quality. The laser disc with its tiny capacity and its large weight and size made it completely insufficient. But that doesn't mean it had absolutely no success. Video files, people who are interested or enthusiastic about video technology, liked the Laserdisc, and so many of them had one. It also saw some success in Asia, particularly in Japan, thanks to Pioneer. But it was not well founded in America, due to the high cost of both the players and discs. Only a few years after its original release, the relationship between MCA and Philips broke apart, and the two companies eventually went separate but they still both worked in the same atmosphere. MCA would still produce laser discs and eventually capacitance electronic discs, or CEDs, under the DiscoVision name until 1981, and later changed to MCA Video Disc Inc. and MCA Video Cassette Inc. before changing to MCA Home Video in 1983. They would later become MCA Universal Home Video and be heavily associated with Universal in the film industry until their death in 1996, although the name MCA was still in use until 1998. Philips would do the same thing under the name Philips Laser Vision to differentiate it with Pioneer's brand. This logo would only be used for a short time during the 1980s. After that, they began making VHS VCRs and cassettes. One last disadvantage I want to talk about is something called laser rot. Laser rot, also known as color flash, is where you see and hear video and audio artifacts when a laser disc is playing. It would look similar to this, where you would see abnormal colors and hear odd sound. Many early laser discs from the late 70s and early 80s were not manufactured properly, with an adhesive sandwiching the two sides of the disc together. This adhesive could easily explode, if you will, and chemically attack the reflective layers of the disc. Results differ, but the disc would look something like this. They're all different, but they all had the same issue. They weren't built properly. This issue continued across the 1980s into the early 1990s and still happens with poor DVDs and CDs today with something called disc rot. Here are all the pros and cons of the Laserdisc we just talked about. 
It was very clear that Laserdisc was not that popular, but there were a small handful of people like video files that struck an interest in these 30cm discs. That did not stop them from being manufactured however, and in the 1990s, a miracle happened. It made a comeback. Sort of. Out of nowhere, during the very early days of the 90s, Laserdisc began to make a small comeback. By the end of 1990, the Laserdisc made its way into 1 million American households. That sounds like a lot, but when you realize that the population of America in 1990 was 250 million, it wasn't really ubiquitous. Still, lots of people knew what it was. Laserdisc was more popular in Asia because companies like Pioneer managed to keep the prices of both discs and players low in order for some form of adoption to occur, and it worked. During this time, the Laserdisc was more successful in Japan than the VHS was, and if you lived in Japan during the early 90s, it was likely your family owned a Laserdisc player and some movies, especially those in the anime genre. Anime collectors in every country which the Laserdisc format was released quickly became familiar with this format, and found the higher video and sound quality of the Laserdisc to be better than its now main rival, VHS. They also found a lot more anime films on Laserdisc than VHS. Southeast Asia and places like Singapore saw an increase in sales too. Laserdisc became a popular alternative to video cassettes due to Japanese exports being filled with the thing. They also saw it to last longer than video cassettes, which it can if handled correctly. The LD also became quite popular in Hong Kong during the 1990s before video CD and DVD were brought into the region. Higher rental activity helped the video rental business to grow in Hong Kong larger than it ever has, but not a lot of people bought the discs due to them being expensive. Curiously, when the Laserdisc entered Hong Kong, it used the NTSC colouring system, whilst television broadcast used the PAL standard. China and most of Central Asia used the PAL standard as well, as you can tell by this map. By the way, the Laserdisc wasn't wholly available in countries that used the SACAN format like France. Most players and discs would just say NTSC slash PAL, limiting sales. Although there was a success, it wasn't big enough, and eventually, People wanted to be able to record on Laserdisc, like what the Betamax and the VHS offered, but pretty much every single manufacturer refused. You'd be surprised how many companies produced Laserdiscs and associated players. We all know that Pioneer, Philips and MCA made them, but a few other companies made players too, like Iwa, Akai, Carver, Clarion, Columbia, Denon, EAD, Veruja, Geiger, Hitachi, Kenwood, Luxman, Magnavox, Marantz, Matrox, Macintosh, Mitsubishi, MSB, NAD, National, NEC, Onkyo, Panasonic, Proscan, Quasar, RCA, Realistic, Runco, Samsung, Sansui, Sanyo, Sharp, Sony, Sylvania, Teak, Telefunken, Feta, Toshiba, Yamaha, and Zenith all made Laserdisc models. That gives us a total of 43. Neither of us own a Laserdisc player because, as you can see from eBay, they're expensive and I am really poor. If you've paid close attention to what they look like, you would have seen some odd ones, like this Clarion one and the EAD version. You might have noticed some of these companies had Laserdisc ports and a CD or DVD port. For example, the Macintosh player has both a Laserdisc port and a CD port. You can tell by the logos. This Pioneer machine is both a Laserdisc and a DVD player. This model, the DVL909, was released in 1998. There were some notable players released by Pioneer. For example, the CLD D703 had digital audio. The Pioneer PRR7820 was capable of being controlled by an external computer. You might have noticed on this EAD play it has theatre vision on the front. I'm not entirely sure what they mean by theatre vision, but I'm assuming it's a variation of Laserdisc, where films are in their highest quality possible, so people who suffer from eye problems can see films better. It's a wild guess, but it seems to fit. I searched up the company EAD and I couldn't get much, but they did make a bunch of other technologies. Another thing I want to talk about is laser film. This sounds like another version of the Laserdisc, but it's in fact a competitor of it. Laserfilm was a video disc format developed by a company called McDonnell Douglas in 1984. Unlike the Laserdisc, where a laser reads the information, 
The laser film has a laser shining on one side of the disc, while it's receiving a sensor on the other side. These weren't around for long, and McDonnell Douglas would later go defunct on August 1st, 1997. Pioneer were taking their Laserdisc very seriously during the 1990s. So much so, there was a video game system on it called Laser Active. This was a converged device and a home video game console capable of playing Laserdisc, compact discs, console games, and even Laserdisc ROMs. It was released in 1993 in Japan and North America. The original price of the system was just short of $1,000 or close to 90,000 yen which is stupidly expensive, even for 1993. The Laser Active allowed players to play Sega CD discs and Genesis cartridges if they owned the Sega module, but even that was $600. The Laserdisc ROM add-on was also $600. The Laser Active only had 36 games, and if you wanted to own every part of it, the price would come to roughly $2,500. As you can probably guess, it did not do very well. It sold 420,000 units, which you could say is a lot, but it was discontinued very quickly in 1996. It was an expensive piece of tech, only to get Pioneer more money, but it was way more successful than what RDI Video Systems created eight years before. In 1985, RDI was supposed to release a laser disc compatible game console called the Halcyon. It was entirely voice activated, which sounds pretty cool, until you realise that A, the voice activity was rubbish, B, it never came out, C, less than a dozen exist, and D, it would cost $2,500. Just watch clips of this video and you'll quickly be able to tell how bad the voice activity is. And I've got, and I've got a choice now. Sorry, Hal. <laughs> sure. Let's go to the forest clearing. One. Blah. One. Speak consistently, Stuart. One. Sir. Two. Two. Is that okay? I mean, <laughs> okay. we're not moving linearly through the story then, right? I mean, it's branching depending on what That's happens. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Say again. When you're talking, he's <laughs> listening to you. Sorry, Hal. You want me to unplug you so he can Yeah, sure. Hear I think we've gotten that point across. Uh -huh. In short, never make a game system based on or including Laserdisc. For a short time, recordable Laserdiscs were available, and they often looked like this. They would have a purple look instead of the silver look of normal Laserdiscs. They were known as RLV discs. It stood for Recordable Laser Video Disc. They weren't very popular, and only a small amount of people used them. There were also CRV discs. CRV stood for Component Recordable Video. They were developed by Sony, and again, they weren't around for long. These acted as a backup storage application. All in all, you can tell that the Laserdisc came a long way. I find it interesting how there were DVD Laserdisc combo machines when DVD was the replacement for the Laserdisc. It did work, and the Laserdisc was discontinued in 2001 after 23 years of use. By that point, most of what was available on Laserdisc was now available on VHS or DVD. The last movie to be released on Laserdisc in America was Paramount's Bringing Out the Dead. The film came out in 1999, but was released onto Laserdisc on October the 3rd, 2000. In Japan, the last movie to be released on Laserdisc was Golden Harvest Tokyo Raiders on September the 21st, 2001. The last Laserdisc player was of course made by Pioneer, and it was released on January the 14th, 2009. Whilst not as universal as VHS, they did have a lot to offer. They had more than you think. Laserdisc hasn't got as much love as the VHS, but more people are beginning to research it and are starting to like it. I mean, it's not like you can miss it. We noticed that the Laserdisc isn't well preserved as much anymore, which is a shame because it's actually a pretty interesting piece of technology. What makes it memorable is how many variations there were. 
Technically, Laserdisc has a bigger history than VHS. I would like to own a Laserdisc player and a few discs, but as we've seen, the players are expensive, and there's no point in owning some discs without a player. I really love the Laserdisc as much as the VHS now, and it's all thanks to Russell and Greg from 61 years ago. Thank you very much for watching this documentary. We really hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you all another time. Goodbye! Goodbye. This is Don Herbert with a Laserdisc player from Pioneer. Thank you.